Changes were made to the ancient Camera Obscura. Tom is sitting for the artist Sigrid Holmwood to experiment with this technique. OK, Tom, so I think you might have to come a little bit closer, if you a can. Bit yeah. Oh, no, too close. A bit <laughs> further away. That's it. OK, great. Stay still. OK, so what you need to make a camera obscura is firstly a darkened room. Camera obscura actually means dark room. Um, and then you block out the window um, and you put a hole in it. Daylight bounces off Tom and passes through a lens which flips the image upside down onto the parchment. Early camera obscuras used a pinhole to project the image onto the canvas. But in the Tudor period, lenses were adopted for the first time, making the image brighter and clearer. Even the tiniest movement shows up a lot on this. I'm going to see how this looks soon, but I've got a feeling we might have to try it again. OK, Tom. The thing is, you moved a bit. Um, move now. Yeah, you can move now. <laughs> <laughs> Just so checking. You didn't manage to get your nose. It's gone all weird. Yeah. And it's a bit like also, a witch or something. Yeah, exactly. And um, your whole head's a bit compressed um, because you probably moved in one direction after I'd done that. So, I've been trying um, to lose weight, so... <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the way to do it. They need a way of keeping Tom still. Well, and we're sure this is my fault, this one. <laughs> <laughs> You need to, it's just like back. Victorian photography. You need to be as still as possible. OK, great. That's looking much better now. OK, keep still. It's like a race against time. OK, so in this case, um, we've got his nose and his eyes and his mouth really nicely in focus. But actually, his ear and the top of his head and his hat are kind of receding and quite fuzzy. You've got this area of focus in the centre, and then you've got this area around the outside which gets out of focus. And this creates distortions in scale. It's quite controversial um, amongst our historians how much the camera obscura was used by artists in the past. There's a lot of resistance to the idea because people think it's cheating. I certainly feel that it was used more than people think. This is a bit like being at the dentist. The moment you're told not to move, everything itches. You can feel insects on your face that probably aren't there. You want to cough, but uh, yeah, it's nice to sit down on the farm rather than be working. Sort of. In With the outline of the image completed, Sigrid can now paint the portrait. If the camera obscura doesn't actually give you the whole picture, as it were, how come you don't just paint me from scratch? Well, it's a lot easier to correct something that's already down there than start entirely from scratch. Um, but most importantly, um, it's, the, it's the relationship between your eyes, your nose and your mouth and the very subtle little shapes there which really make the difference in getting a likeness. So the camera obscura is almost like a stencil from which you start your work. Yeah, it's a starting point. You really need to still have lots of drawing skills, lots of artistic judgment um, to be able to use it properly. Um, it's not like taking a snapshot. It isn't that easy to use. Painting was viewed as a craft rather than art in Tudor England, but that would change with the influx of artists from Europe. So would artists travel from, like, village to village looking for work, or...? In terms of portraiture, there would actually be artists would travel from country to country. So there were a lot of um, artists from the Low Countries that travelled to London and were commissioned to do portraits. So an example is Holbein. Um, so he's a little bit later than our period, more active around the 1530s, but he was from Germany and came to London. And when I look at Holbein's drawings, I think they probably were used, done using a camera obscura. There's little telltale signs. For instance, it's a very large head and then with incredibly small shoulders coming off it. During this period, the Mona Lisa was completed. And artists strove to mirror the soul of the sitter in their work. During this time, you start to get a shift towards a more humanist philosophy, um, where you start to look for God in nature and start to look for God in man. And so, therefore, it becomes much more important um, to try and capture what things look like naturally. It's actually much more people's views changing, and then it makes their art change. Art would decorate the walls of Tudor dining rooms, and fish would dominate the tables. Is that you? 
I think I look noble. Yeah, well, you, you certainly, you got that. You're staring off into the distance. Thousand yards stare. Thinking about farming. 